These are really desperate times for legacy media, newspapers, magazines, local TV newscasts, and so on. They are dealing with economic models that no longer work and audiences that mistrust them as never before. Jeffrey Dworkin spent most of his life in journalism and academia, both in the U.S. and Canada, and has a book out on how to fix things. It's called Trusting the News in a Digital Age Toward a New News Literacy. And it brings the former managing editor for CBC Radio, vice president of National Public Radio, and professor at four different journalism schools to our studio tonight. Great to see you here. Nice to be with I you. I can't believe you've been in this game this long, and this is the first visit you've had to the studio. Long overdue. Shame on us. I agree. I agree. <laughs> okay, back to first principles here. When you and I learned how to do what we do, it was about the five W's, right? Who, what, when, where, why. And you think we need a how in there as well so that everybody knows how what we're reporting is true. Why do we need a how as well? I think my time at the U of T Scarborough, which was amazing, and the students were fantastic, and the students are overwhelmed. And if the students are overwhelmed, then presumably their parents are, and the rest of us are overwhelmed as well. And one of the first things I would ask them, these are first year students, 18, 19 years old, very diverse as Scarborough is, a lot of international students, and they don't understand what is appropriate and what to believe and what to trust. How do they not understand that? Because they're, they're swamped. It is a tsunami of stuff that they see on the monitors in the subway that they, as soon as they turn on their, their smartphones and tap into their uh, their, their various media, they see a lot of stuff and they have no idea or very little idea at first how to differentiate among the various flows of s content that uh, soaks them co on a constant 24-hour basis. How do, but again, I'm going to go back at that. How do they not know the difference between the Globe and Mail and some piece of crap website that has no background or v validity? Because I think at the beginning of the process, they don't seem to differentiate among the various levels of journalistic value. Mm -hmm. So that, and especially they're very highly influenced, I think, by friends and family. Mm -hmm. And so when Uncle Fred says, oh, you have to see this, and it's terrific, and they look at it and they send it to another 20 people, but it may be, first of all, misinformation, which is, in my opinion, just sort of ideas that kind of are amusing and we all share it and ha ha ha. And disinformation, which is a deliberate lying to the public. And we saw this going back at least to the 2016 American election, mm -hmm. where uh, uh, bloggers and hoaxers and some criminal intent came from Russia and other places and basically tried to, not to tell people what's going on, but basically to plant doubts. They took advantage of our media illiteracy. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, here's a quote from your book. Let me get this on the record here. Sheldon, you want to bring this graphic up? Journalism, writes Jeffrey Dvorkin, journalism is also being uberized. There is less reliance on staff reporting and more reliance on content spread by freelancers and platforms such as Facebook and Twitter, resulting in less so-called enterprise reporting, where journalists are given the time and the resources to generate original journalism. I want to know what effect you think the uberization of journalism has had on, on how much we trust what we read, see, and hear. I think one of the problems has been that news organizations, and I, for my sins I managed a couple of them, um, don't have the money or the resources and they're being pressed to do more with less. That, that's the cliche, but it's a truth. And what's happened is, is that news organizations still have what they call a news hole to fill an hour or uh, 25 printed pages. Mm -hmm. They've got to fill it with something and they don't have the resources that they once did. So if you're a young reporter in a newsroom and you go to your assignment editor and say, I've got a heck of a story, boss, and I need 10 days to get it together. And your boss is going to say, no way. I need you to fill the news hole today. Maybe I'll give you the day to do it, but that's about it. We used to call it feeding the beast. Feeding the beast, feeding the goat, exactly. Yeah. 
and the problem now is that news organizations are really strapped for money and they're looking for ways in which they can generate audiences, generate eyeballs or ears. Mm. Um, and one of the ways they're doing that is to, in my opinion, is to go after what's easier content to report, the, what I call the low-hanging fruit of local news. And that's often weather, traffic, and crime. Weather, traffic, and crime are all important if done properly, but an over-reliance on them is terrifying. And what it does is it makes the audience, the readership, the viewership frightened. Well, I know you say in the book that, I mean, true or false, we love traffic, weather, and crime and a preponderance of it on our newscasts. And you say false, even though everybody's programming that in local news. That's right, which is why I think there is a, a suspicion and a distrust of media because it all seems to be the same. And it's all the same kind of moral panic that's being sowed by media organizations in order to capture that audience that has disappeared onto the internet. Well, you ask a bunch of good questions in the book about how people can sort of know what to tune into because you tell them you should find, find the good fit for you. And you ask the question, which news organization is most like you? And I want to ask you that question. As you consume news and current affairs, which organizations are most like you? Well, first of all, without flattering you too much, I do watch you all the time. I listen to NPR. I read three print newspapers a day. Which ones? The Star, The Globe, and The New York Times. Interesting. Not The National Post. I occasionally, The National Post. Not The Sun. Not the sun. How the come? sun. Well, the sun, as Michael Enright would say, is basically a, a news organization that has news content to separate the ads for fridges, and uh, I think that that's still the case. Those there fridges some, pay for a lot of salaries. Well, it's that's okay. That's true. However, I think what's happened is is that in this digital environment that we find ourselves in, we are increasingly driven to sort of the lowest common denominator of gossip and celebrity news and weather traffic and crime because it's easy to do. The irony is that weather traffic and crime all come from government sources. So the idea of independent news gathering is less prominent these days than ever before. You ask another question. Which news organization do you distrust the most? So I'll ask you. I distrust any news organization that doesn't identify itself. And when you go online, which we often do, it's important to go to the bottom of the home page to see if there's an about us uh, place that you can click. If that doesn't exist, if there's nowhere on that website that you can contact that news organization and say, what the heck are you doing? I don't trust them. And I, we're seeing increasing amounts of media that is anonymous. And, but it's, it's also very appealing in some ways because it's sort of gossipy. You recall, I'm sure, um, that it was Gawker Media in New York that broke the, uh, the Rob, Rob Ford, Ford story, story yep. because, in my opinion, Toronto media organizations were afraid to go after that story. They had the story. They were afraid to publish it. Exactly. Hmm. Exactly. All right. What... Uh, can I just tell you, I find your answer interesting because, of course, naturally, you being a guy with a lot of history in public broadcasting and journalism schools, I asked you which news organization do you distrust the most, and I assumed you were going to say Fox. And you didn't say Fox News. How come? I, because I never watch it. Oh, really? <laughs> I never. Well, you should. It's hysterical. Um, I, I, I need to save my, <laughs> my, my, my laughter for something a little more, a little more interesting. Okay. Which, uh, another question you ask. Which medium do you go to when you wake up in the morning? How about you? I look at my phone and see what has come in as urgent overnight. Mm. And that's from the Times, the, the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, the Wall Street Journal, um, many, other, many other places. I think what we're finding now is that if I'm overwhelmed by this tsunami of information, mm. a poor 18-year-old kid who's trying to grapple with all this mm -hmm. is, is naturally very confused. And I remember I would ask my class at the beginning of each class, what have you seen in the media that you 
consume that you found interesting? Where did you find it and why did you find it interesting? Mm. And this was, to me, this was the education that I wanted from teaching these students. And often they would say, well, I saw this on a website that I'd never heard of, or somebody inter one, a few years ago, one of my students said, well, there's TikTok. I don't know if you recall back in the olden days when an assignment editor said, Steve, I want you to do a TikTok on what happened today. And a TikTok in those days was to do a kind of an hour by hour, how the story evolved, and that was a TikTok. And so when the student said, well, we could do something on TikTok, I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> and I realized at that point, it was time to try to look for something else. Well, okay, Th that leads nicely to this next question because back in our day, Woodward and Bernstein and their coverage of Watergate and their helping to, frankly, bring down an American president was, was so much of the inspiration that I think motivated us to either get into journalism or do better journalism or whatever. If you said, Watergate, Woodward and Bernstein, Washington Post, to your students today, would they know what any of that meant? Not really. They would have to, first of all, I, bl <laughs> I don't blame journalism education only, but we're seeing a lot of journalists, or a lot of students of journalism rather, coming into the business without a real appreciation or background to what has happened first in this city and secondly in this country. Um, I would play a National Film Board of Canada documentary, which came out right after the October crisis, a couple of years after the October crisis. We should remind everybody, that's 1970, the Nin FLQ, terrorism in Quebec. Exactly, okay. and, the, and the declaration of martial law by Pierre Trudeau. Yes, War Measures Act. None of them had ever heard of it. Hmm. So I played this documentary for them and said, if you were a journalist in Montreal or in Toronto, under these circumstances, how would you report something that the government didn't want you to report? Hmm. And they were astonished, and especially the international students. They said, I had no idea that that's what happened in quiet old Canada, that there was this turmoil. And I said, and the turmoil extended there was something like 400 people that were arrested in Montreal without habeas corpus, many of them journalists. How would you report that? And what I wanted them to do was, there's no clear answer, obviously, mm -hmm. but I wanted them to struggle with the idea that there is no clear answer. And to me, that's the essence of journalism. What the digital culture has done is that it has smoothed things out, it has simplified, it doesn't ask tough questions. And I think that, the, I mean, there's still some great journalism that's being done everywhere, including on Canadian te television news and on, in the newspapers, but it's not the same as it once was. And I don't want to lament, you know, saying, oh, I wish, I wish we were back in the good old days when I was young. Well, of course I do. But the issue now is, is that the digital culture has hollowed out journalism to an incredible extent. And we have to figure out ways in which we can, as citizens, demand more of our media. Well, if it's not, okay, let's grant them this. Let's grant the younger people this. Watergate was 50 years ago. The War Measures Act was more than 50 years ago. What more recent event, if any, animates them or motivates them, inspires them to be better journalists? Is there anything? A lot of them don't, weren't born when 9-11 happened. Yikes, that's right, that's more than 20 years ago now. That's right. Yeah. And so when we talk about um, how, what are we going to believe and from which source, how do you verify the source of information? And this is one of the things that we talked about a lot, which is, in the, again, in the olden days, I'm much older than you, of course, but- Not as much as you think. Well, we <laughs> needed two sources in order to, do, to get a story right. That seems to have vanished. And the other thing is, is that there is a generation gap inside media organizations. I think journalism schools have done a pretty good job in getting people out there and they're getting jobs. A lot of my students are ending up at the, at the uh, CBC and at the uh, Globe and Mail. Mm -hmm. It's great, wonderful, and the, and the Toronto Star. Um, a lot of them are 
come from very diverse backgrounds. Management is still, the older management cohort is still white, increasingly female, but of that idea that journalism is not a profession, it's a craft. Mm -hmm. And it's not like you come out of journalism school, like you come out of med school and say, okay, I'm a, now I'm a doctor. You come out of journalism school and say, okay, let me get a job that can show what I can do for journalism. Hmm. Now, to their credit, a lot of media organizations have hired these younger people from more diverse backgrounds, and they are less willing to take the time required to learn what the craft is. In fact, they want a seat at the table right away because they have been told that their ideas have value. There was an incident at the Toronto Star in the last federal election. Toronto Star, to its credit, does editorial boards on the record with all leaders of all the parties. Who deign to show up. And the mostly, for the Toronto Star, they will. Okay. Um, they invited Maxime Bernier. And a lot of these younger journalists said, we're not coming to that editorial board because we don't like him. So one of the interesting, this became a bit of a crisis, a generation gap inside the newsroom. And the Toronto Star isn't the only one feeling this. The, the CBC, the New York Times, the Washington Post, there are these younger journalists who feel, for better or for worse, that they have something to offer and they're not willing to work lousy shifts and do stories that they think are <laughs> stupid. And, and then after, in 10 years, maybe they get a chance to talk at the morning editorial meeting. Well, okay, you've got a, an excerpt in this book. Sheldon, let's go to page four here, board two, because you, you've got a, a, uh, an excerpt in the book that speaks to this. People go into journalism, you write, believing that they are performing a civic good. Many don't believe they enter the field to be advocates for specific values. In general, journalists believe that the power of information is ultimately liberating. The idealism of many journalists, combined with an innate sense of curiosity about the world, is what usually motivates people to become journalists. However, this also leaves them vulnerable to charges of bias. Of course, not all people who work in journalism are that high-minded. Some see journalism as a road to power, wealth, and influence. In some cases, this happens to be true. And I'd go on from, from that excerpt to say, it feels like today, particularly what you've just described, that there are two kinds of journalists. There's the Sergeant Joe Friday journalist, just the facts, ma'am. And then there are those who, you know, who are in it to, to and I, I understand this is a pejorative expression, but you know, they're social justice warriors. They have their view of how the world should be. And, and they intend to use journalism to affect that conclusion. They're picking a side. Do you have a problem with that? Depends what the story is. Yeah. I think that if, if I were a reporter at the CBC, which I was for a number of years, I would go out and I would try to do the story as fairly and as contextually as possible. That's because the news division at the CBC and, and in many other places, felt that there was an obligation to report as close to the truth as possible. There was also a department called Current Affairs. And Current Affairs at the CBC allowed for a, if you like, a broader exposure to ideas and opinions and, and feelings and emotions. And that was entirely legitimate. The problem, in my opinion, is that everything is now information. And when it's all just information, it seems not to matter whether you're giving the audience the facts that allow them to make a decision or whether they are part of an emotional experience caused by events. So what we're seeing now is, and goodness knows that there are a lot of issues out there now that require and evoke an emotional response. We think of the, the issue around indigenous lives in Canada, mm -hmm. the war in Ukraine, uh, COVID, it goes on and on. And it's very hard not to feel emotional about many of these issues. The question is, if you are in Ukraine doing a story on the latest bombing in Kyiv, it's, it's very difficult to be dispassionate about that. And I think one of the things that we're, we're seeing now is the need for 
a little more dispassion or at least an appropriate expression of that passion in order to allow people to understand the story better. I think one of the things that we're finding now in journalism is the limits of what I, I think is that one of the limits of storytelling. Storytelling, and I'm complicit in this because back at the CBC I, I talked about let's, what is the focus of the story. And the focus statement for a story meant find an individual, describe what that person is going through, and, and talk about that person's emotional response, and that way we'll hook the audience to identify with the difficulties that this person is going through. And I think that, that at a time when context is lost and emotion has become heightened because that appears to be a way in which news organizations can grab back that audience that's been dissipated onto, onto the internet, I think that, that storytelling is, a, is kind of manipulative in some ways. Well, okay, that speaks to the next issue I want to hit on with you, which is trust. Yes. We got a problem with trust right now. Uh, Sheldon, bottom page three, Douglas Murray, New York Post columnist, clip from him from the Monk debate, this is a little over a month ago, arguing against trusting the mainstream media, even though he works for one. Let's go. In this country, your media, your mainstream media, is funded by the government. <laughs> a totally corrupted system. In 2018, oh, election year, coincidence, the Canadian media has given $595 million over five years. In Canada, they can also tell the media what to do, and the media does the bidding of the, can of the Canadian government. That isn't a free society's media. That's, I've seen unfree um, countries all my life, but this, in a developed liberal democracy like Canada, is a disgrace. He's essentially calling the government's attempt to subsidize the legacy media because of their declining revenues to the tune of $600 million a disgrace. Do you agree? I tend to agree. And part of it is, is that I, in my time in Washington, I guess I drank too much Potomac water. <laughs> but I found that the idea of having a certain financial independence um, tends to make the journalism often better. Not always, but often better. And I think one of the things that we're finding now is that if the government gives money to media organizations without any uh, conditions, in the same way that the government, the provinces want the federal government to give money for health care. With no strings. With no strings. Yeah. The, I think the problem is, is that if news organizations are given more money to do their job without changing the nature of the relationship between news organizations and citizens, mm. then we're just rewarding mediocrity. Hmm. In which case, what do we do about... I mean, the newspapers say, if we don't get those hundreds of millions of dollars, we're all going to die. And therefore, they've managed to convince the government that, that the government has an interest in, in a thriving democracy by keeping those newspapers alive. If you're concerned about what that relationship then becomes because of that subsidy, what do we do instead? I have an idea. Go. I think we turn the media landscape on its head and that we give more power to local sources of information. For example, in this group that I work with called Public Broadcasting in Canada for the 21st Century, we're proposing that the CBC basically reinvest in local news. Right now, there are news deserts in this country, especially out west, part of the Maritimes, where there's no coverage. And whatever coverage they can manage to cobble together is mostly weather, traffic, and crime. Okay, it snows in Alberta in the winter. That's not a headline. This just in. This just in, exactly. <laughs> and I think that that's one of, the, one of the ways that we could restore the value of journalism, which treats the audience as citizens first and consumers second. That won't save newspapers. It could save newspapers if the strings attached to this money would be to bolster their regional newsrooms hmm. and to allow for more investigative reporting. Local news and investigative reporting is the lifeblood of democracy in, the, in any country. And what we see here is... Okay, we have some very good 
newsrooms in Montreal and Toronto, a couple other places perhaps, but not as much as this country deserves and requires. Okay. I, I I have another 40 questions I want to ask you, but I'm literally down to my last minute here, so I'm going to try this one. And I'm asking you this question because you've been, as we said in the intro, you've been uh, teaching young people how to do this at four different journalism schools on both sides of the border. And my question is, do you think we're playing a cruel joke on these students by bringing them into journalism schools, educating them for a media landscape that frankly no longer exists? the jobs that they would hope to graduate into are disappearing. I am more optimistic than that, I have to say. My students, many of whom stay in touch with me, thank goodness, are telling me they get jobs, various news organizations, which shall go nameless, and they're pushing. They say, well, why are we doing the story in this way? So one of my students, whose family comes from Uganda, he's a terrific kid, not, he's no kid anymore. Um, he was told, go, he was working on the online site of this media organization. And his supervisor for his shift said, I want you to go on YouTube, find something vaguely Canadian, write some copy around it, and then it becomes our story. And my student said to him, well, why don't we do the story ourselves? And he said, uh, we don't do that. We'd leave that to, and he named another news organization. And I think that the problem is, is that there, there's a lot of talent in newsrooms in this country, but they have been driven down by the relentless idea that it's ratings above all, and if we can't get the ratings, we're all in trouble. And instead of putting that on its head and saying, if we can't do journalism that serves the public contextually, that's what our goal should be. And if we can't do that, then we should be out of this business. We've talked almost a half an hour and barely scratched the surface of your book, which was a terrific read, Trusting the News in a Digital Age Toward a New News Literacy, which, yes, we need. Jeffrey Dvorkin, thanks for coming into TVO tonight. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.